Welcome to Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here is the podcast host, James Delling Pool. Welcome to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool. I am so excited about this week's special guest. A lot of you have been asking for him, and finally, I've I've pinned him down. It is none other than Sir Roger Scruton, philosopher, probably the, one of the most eminent figures in conservative thought right now. I mean, I, I can only think of Thomas Sowell um, ab- above him just because he's a bit older. But um, I think, Roger, you are among the legends. So welcome to the show. Well, thank you for those flattering remarks. Quite undeserved, but... Well, that's the thing. You are quite modest. And, and uh, yes, possibly um, if p- people on the left w- w- would consider I was brown-nosing you, but it's, but it's, it's actually sincerely felt. Mm. I was thinking, before we go on, that if you were a man of the left, you would have a, a lucrative New York Times column like mm. Paul Krugman, or you would be the darling of American univer- Amer- dumb American college kids, and the, you'd be on their, on their sweatshirts like Chomsky. <laughs> you know, Noam Chomsky actually has, has shirts with his name printed on mm. them. They worship him. Or you'd be a kind of rock star intellectual like Bernard Henri Le- Levy, or so, and yet because you're on the right, you are okay. You got a knight, you got a knighthood last year, which, which, mm. which rather surprised me. Not that you didn't deserve it, but you, but yeah. but you know what I'm saying? Yes, uh, of course. I've lived with this thought myself. You know um, <laughs> that uh, 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 didn't I make a, a terrible career move, age 21, when I w- woke up to the fact that I was not not a man of the left? But um, you know, it's unavoidable. Uh, the, why it is, it's a deep cultural matter, you know, why it is that uh, the culture, in, at least at, at the intellectual level, has shifted so much to the left, but a kind of soft, self-indulgent, self-congratulatory left, rather than the old revolutionary left. Um, why that has happened, I think, is a very deep question, but uh, certainly there was no way in which someone like me could go along with it. Uh, and my my pos- position politically and culturally uh, aligns me with those who who keep their heads down, you know. Uh, and so my head is down too. Do you think there was ever a time then? I was, I was quite surprised by what you said. Do you, do you think there was a time when actually the right did um, have a place in the intellectual current? Well, in Britain, you remember, we never really. Uh, esteemed intellectuals. We've always uh, thought of um, the the educated person uh, as the ideal of uh, uh, of the um, intellectual life, rather than the intellectual as an independently acting political being. Uh, and I, but um, if you look back to the nineteenth century, uh, uh, educated gentlemen were running this country, and people like Disraeli. And Gladstone and so on. They, these were real intellects and uh, genuinely learned people. And I think that continued, you know, on and off until the after the Second World War, and gradually it all declined. And um, you know, uh, we entered a new situation in which uh, for learning as such was no longer esteemed, but vociferous pretenses. Uh, we took the place of it. And going back, um, I suppose, to what, Dr. Johnson's time, mm. how, how, how would we have got on then? Do you think we'd have, we'd have been happy or do you think there would have been ghastly, wiggish well, types there? P- people like you and me <laughs> would have... Uh, I mean, we're destined to be unhappy anyway. I mean, that's uh, because we're critically reflective always. Um, and, you know, one can't say that Dr. Johnson was happy, uh, uh, but he... he he set an example that um, I guess uh, we should all follow that of somebody who who uh, thinks reflectively about the society in which he is, but does not want to disrupt it, but humbly wants to find a place in it, and also to justify the ordinary feelings of the ordinary person, insofar as they are, you know, morally uh, uh, rooted, and insofar as they contribute to the. O- ongoing stability of the social order. That that kind of uh, position of the 
thinking person is one that I think I've always wanted to conform to. It is an 18th century position, undoubtedly, but it's um, always been there in our culture until very recently. You say we'd have been unhappy but uh, in the 18th century, um, but you would have thought the people who ought to be unhappy are the kind of the left-wing idealists who want to remake the world. Mm. And yet here we are, you and I are both conservatives mm. Sur- surely conservatives ought to be more comfortable in their in their times well uh, depends how much of the what they want to conserve remains you know mm. always a conservative has is um, beset by the fear that the things that he that really matter to him uh, are vanishing more quickly than he can repair them and I, I'm not saying that Johnson had that view I think in the 18th century there was a sense that there was something permanent there that one can hold on to, bring in, bring to the attention of uh, society as a whole and thereby safeguard it. We are in a much more fragile uh, situation. But the people who were genuinely happy or, or at least exultant, let's say, in the 18th century were the revolutionaries, the people, you know, you know the... What, well, you mean Wordsworth and, and, and Coleridge getting excited about what was going on in France? And well, you said that the French, the, 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 the grands excités themselves, in, you know, they were the ones who, um, who, who rejoiced in the 18th century, and people like Diderot and, and so on. Uh, I wouldn't say they were happy in the deep metaphysical sense of being at ease with themselves. Quite clearly they weren't. But they had the joy of cutting off the heads of other people, you know, which was to them... A tremendously exciting experience. It's clearly a very powerful impulse within the human species, isn't it? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, And um, it's the fashion is growing. Um, Yes. Well, we'll come. We'll come to that. I think in in Mm. in the in the the later uber depressing part of the of this of this broadcast. I was thinking about Wordsworth and and Coleridge and and Co. Mm. Um, They are the equivalent, aren't they, of well, slightly more intellectual version of of Gary Lineker. And the people on the various people on Twitter, um, uh, all the pop stars, and all the people sort of pronouncing on on uh, their left wing views. Well, actually, you have to remember, although Wordsworth, in particular, you know, famously said was, uh, you know, Bliss um, was it in that dawn to be alive. You know, when it, about the French Revolution, he changed his mind later and became a seriously conservative th- thinker. And Coleridge was always conservative in uh, uh, in his stance, and he was much influenced by Kantian idealism and by the things that were happening in Germany uh, to think in a much more um, comprehensive way about what um, societies really are. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, his little strange book on the constitution of church and state was perhaps the first real expression of conservative views. Uh, uh, well, apart from Burke's reflections on the revolution in France that, that we that we have. So I think um, although they were, okay, they were um, stirring things up, they both of them became uh, settled conservative thinkers. Okay, what about Byron though? People like that. And Shelley. Sh- I mean, well, Shelley is the real problem. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Shelley's famous pronunciation of uh, man, not men, you know, that the, the, everything was to be de- de- devoted to the abstract idea of humanity rather than the particular obnoxious beings who represent it. Mm. You know, that is, that is the archetypal um, liberal philosophy. We're not really interested in ordinary uh, sorted individual human beings, but only in this ideal of humanity which which w- washes us clean of every sin that we per- that we commit in pursuing it. I, I've been tiptoeing ar- around because I, I haven't really wanted to broach the awfulness of what's happened in the last 24 hours. Mm. We are, for those listening in the future, we are broadcasting this on the, the morning after one of the most, I think, disastrous conservative election results ever in that Theresa May, the Prime Minister, started this general election. She called a general election with a 24-point lead and managed to throw it all the way in the course of an extremely lacklustre election and ended up, has ended up with a hung parliament in which a, a newly powerful opposition is led by uh, unreconstructed communist, really, throwback, mm. Jeremy Corbyn. 
Um, how are you feeling about this, Roger? <laughs> I'm not feeling too good about it, I have to say. Uh, I didn't expect there to be a big majority, I have to say, because um, it was quite clear as her campaign, if you can call it a campaign, proceeded that, um, you know, that uh, someone like that who had at some stage in her life a charisma bypass and you know, has also without a philosophy um, and was not taking any any public stance on anything really that was she was bound to erode what credibility the Conservative Party had um, so I didn't expect it to be a great victory but I, I was clinging to the uh, view uh, the hope that the British people would see Jeremy Corbyn for what he is, as, as a real threat to our national security and national sovereignty, uh, and, uh, uh, and as you say, an unreconstructed leftist, if not a, a communist, of a kind that I thought we'd grown out of. I want to talk to you more about that in a moment, about how it is that the young have had, had their brains captured by mm. this, this awful man. But first of all, I wanted to ask you a question, and you're the perfect man to answer it, about conservatism, in that you wrote one of the most inspiring essays I've ever read on conservatism. And I'm sorry for flattering you again, but it's, it's that wonderful article you wrote about when you became a conservative mm. in, in Paris in, in 68. Oh, right. mm. um, and can you just briefly just say what, what it was that attracted you to conservatism and how it happened? Yes, uh, um, it's interesting that it happened in France, uh, you know, during... The, I, I was fairly apolitical by the time I'd gone through my uh, university education, but I was there at the time of the 68 uprising, and um, I, I was observed the things happening in the street below where I was, and, uh, and um, I recognised in myself that whatever it was that um, animated those uh, so-called students in the street below me, whatever it was that they believed, I believed the opposite. And the, the, henceforth, I was going to find out what that opposite was. Um, you know, uh, the, the sight of people destroy, randomly destroying the property of the lower orders because they had the privilege of a, of a so-called education to justify it was, to me, very repulsive. And, and at the time, I was reading de Gaulle's Mémoire de Guerre, you know, and I've, I had conceived a huge admiration for de Gaulle as somebody who came out of the, or came through the last war with a sense of why he, he was fighting it uh, uh, and the sense of the, the real difference between, between treason and loyalty. Uh, and that what I saw in the streets, uh, uh, to me, was treason. It was the young people with all the privileges that the French state had bestowed upon them, uh, throwing uh, their loyalty away, recognising no obligation towards the, the society that had created them, uh, for, just for the sake of the, the same old exaltation, you know, the, the, the delight in destruction. In the modern parlance, you were red pilled at that moment. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and you've and of course you you chose the hard path as as we all have. Yes, I suppose so. Um, uh, well, I've just started thinking about it. I got really interested in you know what the alternative to the liberal and socialist views of the day were uh, was, and um, so I spent my life. I would I would say actually I'm not. Primarily a political thinker. I, my my love is art and music and literature. Um, but I saw those uh, those things as equally threatened by by this kind of revolutionary posture. And uh, also, I f I felt that coming out of my my sense of why literature and and music and things matter so much, coming out of that was a, a, a sense of the, an ideal community in which these things would flourish. And so I, I, I got thinking about politics very late in the day, I suppose. It's very interesting what you say there, because I feel very much the same. I, I started out my, my journalistic career writing about music, about, mm. about books, about films. This is, this is what, what I love. I love the country. Yes. I love, I love, I love horses. I love, mm. I love, and Unfortunately, um, when you realise that the things, you, the framework of freedom that you so value and that makes all this art and literature possible is under threat, 
you don't really have a, much of a choice in the, in the same way that I suppose the civilians in World War Two didn't have much of a choice other than to mm. enlist and go out and fight for it. Yes, I think that's right. Yeah, um, I, 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 but I actually, I also got really interested um, during the course of doing research in in, in aesthetics, actually, in, at Cambridge. It, I got really interested in um, how it how it would be possible to formulate a complete philosophy in answer to the complete philosophies of the liberals and the uh, and the socialists was they that that's what's all what was obviously appealing to people in in the 60s and the 70s in in marxism and also in its softer variants was that there there was a complete philosophy of life contained in it whereas conservatives uh, as i got to understand them were people who were uh, were getting through life without a philosophy you know improvising uh, making adjustments, cl- um, clinging to the things that they valued, but without having any a- a- account of why it was that they should value them. It's interesting you say that because I look at the liberal philosophy. I, I, I once got sent a book on on to review on liberalism, mm. a great big doorstopper of a, of a book, and I started reading it, and I just I just gave up in in frustration and disgust because it seems to me that there is no coherent philosophy of liberalism or, or, or Marx. I mean, what's what's the, the, the presiding thought behind Marxist di- dialectics or he- Hegelian? Well, it, it makes no sense. It's, 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 it's anti-logic, isn't it? Isn't it? I'm not sure. You see, that it depends on which version, of course. But uh, no, there, there was, uh, looking back at my experience in 1968, it was very clear that uh, there were systematic answers to every question of the day that the left could give. Um, first of all, that they lived in a society which was controlled by this thing called the bourgeoisie. You know, we don't really know uh, how to define it, you and me, but they had uh, nice shifting definitions of it. We are opposed to that thing. That thing is oppressing us. It dominates us. We're in a society of domination in which we must side with the subordinates uh, and that uh, we're acting on behalf of equality and liberation. Uh, We liberate ourselves from the institutions. We overthrow these old forms of authority and control, etc. The whole thing pours out in a systematic flow uh, of of course, of idiocies, but they are intellectually polished idiocies, which people um, play around in their hands as though little jewels, you know. Uh, and all the discussions and dial- all the dialogues of my contemporaries, the st- who were students in Paris, uh, were in that took that form, uh, and it was all wonderful. It's quasi-religious because it it, uh, it, it involved a jargon a kind of transcendental jargon which refused to to look at realities but but played only with abstractions but it was a, a comprehensive philosophy which, which justified everything in particular it justified this posture of repudiation and rebellion against things and i i i, I suppose you could say that i started life politically as a rebel against rebellion and did you formulate a, a, a conservative philosophy that you can condense in the next two minutes of this section? <laughs> well, uh, uh, yes, I, I, I could condense it into one sentence, uh, that um, conservatives are people who, who love something actual and want to retain it. I love that. I'm going to end the section on that, and we're going to move on in a moment. You're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my very special guest, Professor Sir Roger Scruton. Check out the official Breitbart store today. Store.breitbart.com is the home for the brand new official Breitbart store. Head there now for products for women and men, like t-shirts, baseball tees, tank tops, hoodies, and hats, or an unapologetically American belt buckle. Store.breitbart.com has these items and many more. So get your gear now at store.breitbart.com. This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Pool. Welcome back to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool, and my very special guest, Professor Sir Roger Scruton. We were talking about conservatism, and, and you, you, um, you expressed the perfect philosophy just a moment ago, which I, 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 I'm going to cherish. Um, Tell me, though, 
I read a quote somewhere, a famous one, I can't remember who said it, that, that conservatism is whatever the, pri- the conservative prime minister does. Mm. Who, who, was, who said that? I don't know. Some, was, some, yeah. Somebody tedious. But it's, it mm. seems to me that, that conservatism is, is I, I don't buy into the idea that, that it's all about, about whatever the, the, the brand, the, the name on the tin. I, it seems mm. to me that, that Theresa May, for example, was not a conservative, is not a conservative. W- w- what's your view on that? Well, I suspect she is a, a conservative in the sense that she has she's attached to a, a way of life and a, and a pattern of institutions which have made this country what it is, and she does want to conserve them. Uh, her, um, her, her problem is that she doesn't have any fully imaginative grasp of what that, that means, and um, she's feeling her way. Uh, you know, you have to remember that she was... She became Prime Minister without having been elected as Prime Minister. Also, she read geography. Which yeah, well, there you go. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so all sorts of... Uh, we mustn't be too unkind no. uh, about her. I mean, she, Ungallant, no. Yeah, she tried, uh, um, but she obviously adopted a kind of bunker posture as soon as she actually received power, because she didn't receive it from the people. She received it from the party. Uh, in, in in those strange circumstances that David Cameron created with the Brexit uh, referendum, well, we all know that you know the recent volatile history of, uh, of British politics has put her put her in a strange situation anyway. But um, I, I think there again going back to what we were talking about, my attempt to formulate a conservative philosophy comes from my sense that there really is such a thing as the conservative instinct. Uh, that it is in all of us, and it ought to be in government rather than all these uh, excited alternatives, uh, but that it doesn't spontaneously express itself as a philosophy. Uh, Indeed, Burke put his finger on it when he said that it consists of prejudices, meaning by that um, the accumulated wisdom of mankind, which is threatened by the attempt to express it. Because when you attempt to express it, you're condensing into one head something that exists only in the many millions of heads which co- co- cooperate in retaining it. Uh, so all attempts at a conservative philosophy will fall short of, uh, of giving its real depth. But it, this is no excuse for not attempting to, it, uh, to do it, because you've still got to uh, articulate things in the world in which we live. And so my, my, you know, I've looked over the, the, the past of all this and I came to the conclusion that it has been articulated, of course, by, by Burke himself. And it's interesting that that, um, that word prejudice has been hijacked by the other side to mean something bad, whereas in yes. Burke's day it probably meant something, it, it, it meant judgment, didn't it? Yes. Not having yes. nice judgment. Uh, a judgment that precedes the evidence, however. Uh, and organises the evidence. And yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, I agree. Uh, all these things, which you know, words which are thrown at us uh, uh, as terms of abuse, often in their proper meaning, are not discrimination. Discrimination, not- exactly. That that means making making judgments, uh, 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 holding against people the bad qualities that they have. So, how do we? How do we reclaim the the, the intellectual? Well, mm. not I mean, that, I, never mind the intellectual. That, that's for the birds. Mm. But how do we how do we speak to the young people? Yes. How do we persuade them that actually they are conservatives? Really, they just don't know it. Um, war is the usual thing that does this, uh, and uh, you know the Islamists have declared war on us, and one by one, young people might wake up to the fact that they they're under threat. So they've got to think of the things that they want to retain and the things that they that they they can uh, live with losing and so on. That's an awful thing you've just said, but I think it's probably mm. true, isn't it? I think it is. Yeah, uh, uh, it, and war is is natural to to mankind. It's not you know it's the periods of peace which are the extraordinary exceptions. Only the dead have seen the end of war. I can't yes. remember who, who said that, uh, yeah, but it's that. A, it's in the Imperial War Museum, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Yes, and also there was, there's another wonderful quotation uh, as you go down in, in, down that ramp in, into the World War One section of the Imperial War Museum. Uh, I think it's Thucydides who talks about how um, there were lots of young m- men around who had never experienced war and were consequently very excited about it. The reason mm. is, I think, in the young male particularly, this, yes. this impulse. Of course. 
uh, it's one of the real um, problems that we're living through now. We're um, breeding, well, we're not breeding, but young men are breeding which uh, who are living in a situation where they want conflict. Mm. And they want conflict for a variety of reasons. Um, but if we look at the Islamists, um, one of the reasons is that they've, they're young men without women uh, uh, and without drink. You know, and these are the two things which have helped us to get through all the difficulties over the, uh, since the Second World War and live in this uh, soporific, peaceful atmosphere. We, you know, we, we have a, an easy life where we can, where, where we can relate to the other sex in a, in a very problem-free way and where we can also get heartily drunk every week with our friends. You know, uh, if you were brought up in the heart of that community, but but with a sense that women are untouchable unless they are uh, unless they are alien, in which case you can abuse them as you wish, um, and also that uh, that there isn't this uh, matey, uh, easygoing uh, uh, collaboration with uh, with the temptations of the day that that uh, most young pe- young British people live through. It is extraordinary, isn't it, how you and I grew up in a world where the Battle of Tours was was history, mm. <laughs> and 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 uh, the siege of Vienna, and stuff like that. It was it was the, these were all things that that were mm. never going to happen again. Yes. Mm-hmm. How how why has it all come back? Well, uh, I wish I knew. Uh, I, I, I mean, conflicts will always come back uh, but this particular one is a deep existential conflict which has been uh, taken on a new form because the islamic world was contained within uh, within its recognized boundaries which had been essentially established by the ottoman empire which itself had been re- uh, pushed into its uh, sort of basic form by by the first world war and then broken up um, uh, probably foolishly broken up. Uh, if it hadn't been broken up, we might be a bit safer now. But um, it wasn't until very recently, with things like the internet, you know, the massive expansion of knowledge about the West that came into the Middle East, and also the fragmentation that's come through, uh, uh, you know, through the global economy and so on. That, uh, that that people in that part of the world felt that their boundaries should were no longer retaining them uh, and um, you know th- th- there was this wonderful treasure right on the doorstep of the old Islamic world namely Europe undefended um, you could immigrate anywhere into it uh, and enjoy what it had to offer which is not on offer in the Middle East namely wine and women and and the, and all that those two things mean and so we have uh, huge settlements in our midst, uh, and you know, people came with every peaceful intention. Many, at least, many of them, uh, and the Algerians who came into France, they, they came with peaceful intentions and um, wanted to be part of everything. But then they have children, and they bring up these children in a way which, which isolates them from the surrounding culture. Uh, and they have a; these children have a problem of identity. Who, to what do we belong? We don't belong to this thing around us, because that's all, um, uh, you know, uh, it's impious, uh, uh, um, blasphemous, and also it's not us. We can't relate to it in the in the way that it requires. So inevitably, they look for another identity and an ide- an antagonistic identity, and that's the problem that we've created for ourselves. To what extent do you think our cultural decadence, our moral relativism has invited our own destruction? Well I think that undeniably it has been a a factor you know that you can't you can't uh, attract a young person brought up in a in a pious Muslim family into your community simply by saying that that uh, everything goes you know um, and uh, 
that there are no values and nothing is worth anything anyway, so just have a good time. That's not what uh, what young people of that uh, education want. They want to find something which integrates their spiritual inheritance with a, a, a properly prosperous way of life. And that is, uh, they're forced to choose between the two. The prosperous way of life comes through engaging with the relativistic society around them, uh, but the spiritual fulfilment uh, then has to be left behind. But where do, where do you... Big question. Where did it all go wrong? Where did, where did it all start going wrong? <laughs> what, <laughs> well, uh, uh, I'm, it, it's... You know, there are two uh, big factors, in my view, which are, are, are relevant here. One is that uh, um, the, there was mass mig- the mass migration policies that our governments uh, encouraged... Uh, may, which um, were not motivated, actually, by economic considerations. They pretended they were, but they were uh, mo- motivated by what I call o- oikophobia, this this dislike or repudiation of your own home. You know, uh, th- uh, there was a desire, especially on the left, to punish ordinary people for loving the place where they are. They were going to be um, told, about, you know, told off for this, to show, showing that they were really racists and xenophobes. And the way to do this was to plant in the midst of their communities these other communities which challenged them. Has has oikophobia? But was it a phenomenon before the twentieth century? Um, hard to say. I don't think it was. Um, although Shelley, I suppose, is an instance. Uh, come to think of it, I mean the, 19, the the Romantics had elements of this, um, but no, it's, it's, it 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 comes through the complete repudiation of an inherited culture, uh, and um, it's taught to, to children in schools and universities especially. Um, but that's one of the factors that caught, that led to the mass immigration policies pursued, especially by the Labour Party. You can see that it goes with the left wing point of view anyway this refusal to defend the homeland and indeed to rebuke the homeland for being a home then the second factor of course being that that uh, people did not see that there was a difference between the kinds of immigrants that come in some you know christians coming in from eastern europe is very different from muslims coming in from somalia Um, uh, 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 there is a difference with uh, as to how far people can integrate and how far they can't. Uh, we were misled in this, of course, understandably, by the experience of the British Empire. We we produced in Pakistan a whole uh, section of Muslim society which was genuinely uh, compatible with ours. And we thought, therefore, let's let the Pakistanis come in. But we didn't realize that there were two, four, two lots of Pakistanis. There's the ones who had who had become acclimatized to the uh, imperial administration and, and loved the whole idea and loved the rule of law and so on. And then there were the villagers, uh, the, the incipient Taliban uh, Pakistanis, who uh, who had no understanding of that. So we, we ended up with a, with c- c- a mi- completely mixed community of immigrants, some of which could assimilate and some of which couldn't. How much do you think um, our weakness, uh, this malaise, this oikophobia, owes to cultural Marxism? Well, it's cultural Marxism, uh, as I understand it, is just another name for it. It, it, it is, um, uh, that's to say, uh, finding a denigrating explanation of everything that we are. So, you know, that, that we, we are what we are in culturally... Uh, legally, politically, etc., is simply part of the great machinery of exploitation which maintains in being a privileged class at the expense of the, the underdog. The underdog changes as, our, uh, as the world evolves, but always the, the uberhunt, the overdog, is the same. Uh, so the, the, the exploited working class was replaced by the exploited a female, the woman, you know, uh, um, and then the immigrant, and and so on, and uh, uh, you know, Islamophobia—that's a wonderful word—is invented 
to explain why it is that Muslims uh, don't like us. It's not because they don't like us, it's because we don't like them. You know, always there's that underclass that we've been oppressing. Yes, I think, I think that Islamophobia was a term actually invented by one of the Islamist groups. Uh, That's in, right, in, yeah. in, in, the, in the same way that the, the IRA seemed to ver adept in the use of the, the language of, of human rights and the mm. left, so the, the, the Islamists seem to have absorbed this yeah. self-hating language. Yes, I, well, I think we're, um, it's one of the difficulties that we confront, you know, in, um, with the problem about radical Islam, that uh, um, the language is not there with which to really to grasp the issue. All of us, or not, or at least most of us in Britain, want a negotiated uh, way of life in which the British Muslims live side by side with other British citizens and uh, share the basic loyalty to the nation state uh, and the basic day-to-day uh, -to -day togetherness, which is the precondition of a democratic politics. And I think most Muslims want that. But if you step out of line and actually say that that Islam itself must come, you know, must express itself a bit more and tell us why, just why we've got to accept it and what bits we can criticise and what bits we can't, um, then you run a huge danger because you're, you're, uh, you're going to be accused of, the, of these things like Islamophobia, xenophobia, racism, which haven't got any meaning, but they are simply weapons with which to silence debate. Something I've noticed a lot recently, it seems to me that the left has been getting much nastier, much more aggressive in, in a, a very unpleasant alliance with the Islamists. Mm, that could be so. Um, but I think, it, uh, yes, I'm not sure that... Um, I mean, for the most part, the Islamists are so inarticulate that there isn't anything that they can share, really, with the, with the left. I mean, uh, uh, when... when uh, they can only express their views in defunct theological language, you know, of, uh, of what Allah happens to want, you know, and what he tends to want in their understanding is precisely what ordinary Muslims thinks he couldn't think he couldn't possibly want, you know. I suppose what I mean is that the Antifa, for example, the the, the anti-fascists with their masks and stuff, mm, yeah, um, and their representatives in the media are getting much more aggressive towards anyone who speaks out of turn. Any, uh, they, they, they spot people who are allegedly guilty of Islamophobia. They, they shoot down anyone yes. who ventures an opinion. Uh, that, that's what I meant by the nastiness. Yes, I think it's part of a more general thing uh, the, that, um, you know, it's, it, we're going through a period in which new orthodoxies are rooting themselves, especially among the young. Doctrines and uh, postures and attitudes which are uh, to be made immune from criticism. They've been withdrawn from the whole possibility of debate. Uh, and so there's a kind of vigilance to, to discover those people who still want to debate these things in order to silence them. We've seen this about the, you know, the whole transgender thing and the bathroom question in America, yeah. uh, which is, uh, is comic f seen from outside, but it isn't comic if you're, if you're subjected to the kind of intimidation that goes with it. You know, here is an issue that nobody thought was an issue until about five years ago, and suddenly it's been declared that here is an orthodoxy. Anybody who questions it uh, is going to be punished. So we look around for the people who, who have not yet adopted this orthodoxy and we shame them. Uh, we stop them speaking in universities. We no platform them or whatever, you know. Um, and we don't know, we don't know from one year to the next to one day to the next what the next orthodoxy will be. All that we can guess is that it will be an orthodoxy which is against some ordinary old-fashioned way of way of being that that, uh, that ordinary people maintain. But do you think it was always like this for people of our frame of mind? For example, I I, I think of Orwell saying mm. um, in, in um, times of universal 
deceit, truth for telling is a revolutionary act. Yes. And I was thinking, well, there speaks a man who's been through a lot of the stuff I've been through. <laughs> yeah. But w- was was the left really as lunatic in 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 the nineteen forties or nineteen thirties as as? Well, no, because he Orwell b- believed, and I think rightly, that he lived in a in a society in which there really was an old-fashioned, decent. A left-wing position uh, in support of the working class and so on, uh, in which uh, um, ordinary decencies were maintained uh, and you could identify with that. He thought it was only the intellectuals who were who were to um, who were in the business of silencing debate and uh, and imposing these orthodoxies on people. He believed you could be a, a left-wing person as he was, uh, and have a have a you know a plan for for the for the society of the future, which would be a redeeming plan for the benefit of the working class, and that and that's what a socialist should be doing. But he did find himself up against the Marxist utopians, for whom uh, language was all important. They wanted to re-describe the world using these magic counters of their own, and he's that's what he satirised in 1984, essentially. I suppose we forget, don't we, that that actually we have only recently emerged from a period where there was a major global problem called communism, yes. which you helped to fight in your own way, in well, with your Sam is that literature in. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I was, I had the good fortune to exist when it was still possible to fight communism in the reality. You, you risked being in prison. You went behind the Iron Curtain and risked imprisonment. Yeah, well, didn't you? I, I used to do those sort of things. Yeah. Was it was it scary? Yes, it was always scary. I was always so relieved when I when the aeroplane took off. What what did you do exactly? Back. Just briefly. What? Well, I, I, I and various friends we organised. Um, we helped to start a, an underground university in 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 what was then Czechoslovakia, uh, and that involved publications, visits, um, publications underground. You know, and uh, um, meetings, taking. Get, encouraging people to go there and take materials to t- uh, to talk and to teach, uh, and to build up s- networks of younger people, mostly actually young, early middle-aged people who could be a guidance to the young. And um, we did that in in there and in Poland and to some extent even in Hungary. So it's interesting. Um, you've read Douglas Murray's book that he says that among the places in Europe most resistant to uh, the encroachment of Islamism mm. are the old Eastern Bloc countries. Well, yes, because they've seen what uh, what totalitarianism is and they recognise, you know, that, that there is a new form of it, this religious form, which they might be subjected to if they're not careful. Uh, you're listening to the Dellingpole podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my very special guest, Professor Sir Roger Scruton. More in a moment. Breitbart News Daily with Alex Marlowe. Let's get Bo Deedle in on the conversation. We must stop the immigration until we're effectively able to know who's coming into our country and why you come to America. Do you love our freedom? Well, if that's the reason why you come to America and you want to be part of us, welcome aboard. If you want to come to America and disrupt the freedom and the, and, and, and the great country that we have, you stay the hell out of it. Breitbart News Daily, weekdays from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. East on Sirius XM Patriot 125. This is Delling Pool, a Breitbart.com podcast. Here once again is James Delling Pool. Welcome back to the Delling Pool podcast with me, James Delling Pool, and my very special guest, Professor Sir Roger Scruton. Um, Roger, you've been in academe on and off most mm. of your life. Um students mm. are they are they better or worse or are they always <laughs> the well, same I, I should say that i left the academic world in i think it was 1994 my last jo- proper job was at um, itself only part time actually was at boston university in america so since then i've sort of put my toe into the academic waters every now and then if there's a contract available and yep. i needed the money but I've never not had a proper. I've not been on the payroll uh, um, of, a, of a university. 
I was at very briefly at St Andrews for a six-week period of the year, you know, things like that I've done as part of my career, which is not so different from yours. Have, have, you, a, have you been... Free, freelance... Uh, have you been no-platformed at all, anywhere? Um, well, I was uh, in the old days uh, when I was editing the Salisbury Review at the time of the... Of the um, you know, Ray Honeyford's famous article uh, on the education of the Pakistani minority in Bradford, um, which cost him his career and almost cost me mine. Then I was not exactly no platformed. Uh, when I went to university, uh, I was greeted by the Socialist Workers' Party with, uh, with shrieks and shouts and threats and clenched fists. And indeed, I had to have police protection at one stage. Uh, in, at York, York University, um, but uh, you know, I, I was not popular at all among my colleagues in in London at the t This is in the nineteen eighties, nineteen, yeah, uh, up to nineteen ninety one when I left, and I left with the intention of not going back. I had that part time job in Boston. Uh, and set up a little business in Eastern Europe then, which was uh, and gave me sufficient money to to um, leave. I was I was hoping somehow you were going to give me some gobbit of of, of hope about about well, about students. the young or uh, about. Well, uh, yeah, of course, there's always hope with the young. Um, I have a couple of them myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Sam and yeah, they're, they're friends. My my son's friends with your son. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So um, uh, I I, t I do an MA course as a sort of private enterprise thing through Buckingham University. The people who've come to me for that, some of them are young. The youngest is sort of twenty two, twenty three, right. um, uh, and um, they are sound. All of them. Are they? Uh, yeah, and looking sound, not in the sense of being necessarily politically on the right or anything like that, but sound in their sentiments. You know, they they recognise that that they have a a social being which they owe to the to the country which created them, uh, and that they that things aren't simply to be solved by by uh, leftist formulae for the redistribution of of property or anything like that. Uh, that that's been my experience too with mm. with with my my son's friends and and uh, you know my, my my niece and people like that mm. it, I, I i don't sense that for example the kids at, at oxford and cambridge are any less bright than my generation was mm. and probably your generation was and and you're right about they have the right sentiments in so many ways and yet they seem to ignore all this and and and, and think jeremy corbyn's a good thing yes. how do you explain that well i can as I understand it, uh, Corbyn has hit on a very important thing to say, which is that you know that capitalism is what we're living in. You know the capitalist system in which there's massive inequalities, a few people own everything, nobody else has much of a chance, etc. Uh, but the, but this can be rectified. The state can step in and redistribute things. Uh, and um, uh, and that there's so there is an alternative to capitalism. He's not very clear about what the alternative is, but young people today do find themselves living in a society in which it is difficult to get onto the ladder, uh, the the ladder of pro of ownership. It's difficult to find to to have a place of your own. Um, house prices are astronomical. Jobs are, are randomly distributed. It's not anymore the kind of uh, economy which automatically renews itself by offering apprenticeships to the young, bringing them in to fill to fill the place that's been vacated by some older person who's moved on to retirement. All that uh, old natural economic order has been destroyed yes. uh, by globalization by by uh, by the mass migration of uh, that that the european union has f fostered and so on so they, they 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 think well you know if that's what capitalism is why should i go along with it
Why has nobody been able to make the case that the elites who've taken, the globalist elite, the Davos man, mm. which have taken the controls of the world, mm. are, are really nothing to do with, with, with suddenly with free markets and, and, yeah. and capitalism as, as we might understand it? Why, 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 why has nobody successfully explained that to them? Well, it's, it's, these are difficult things to explain, you know, uh, and if you're brought up in a modern university, you're not given the not. concepts with which to understand such complex things. <laughs> Th exactly. I'm, 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 not, I'm about to explode here. Mm. Universities mm. are... They, they're responsible for everything, aren't they? They teach well, everything. Uh, uh, universities uh, uh, certainly... Well, what is taught in universities depends upon the teachers. They themselves are the products now uh, of the 70s and 80s uh, when uh, our universities went through that catastrophic decline under the influence of the new left, which itself was a, a Parisian product. You know, it's the product of Foucault and, uh, and Deleuze and all that, uh, which produced a, 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 a generation of academics who, who are capable of pontificating in a nonsensical way about the, the, the struggle with the bourgeoisie and all the rest, but didn't have any grasp of, of either of history or of economic science or, of, or certainly of the philosophical conceptions which they would have needed in order to question their own beliefs. There was no questioning at all. And now, uh, you know, everything is fairly dogmatic. You've got to be there's a, a, this narrow range of leftist positions in which feminism is dominant uh, and the idea of equality is unquestionable. Uh, that, that dictates what the curriculum is in the humanities. But we have to remember that there are students who are not studying in the humanities who do things like mathematics, you know, uh, and... Um, uh, and the natural sciences and medicine and so on, who are probably less prone to uh, this diseducated approach than their uh, colleagues in the hum humane disciplines. I've seen this, I, this, this debate characterised recently as the battle between modernism and, and, and postmodernism. Mm. Um, and what, what's being taught now in universities, certainly in the humanities, is really postmodernism, which yes. is a, a different language, isn't it? Well, yes. I, I mean, the humanities, as I understood them when, when I began, I would have described as pre-modernism. They're, they're about understanding the depth, the archaeological depth on which the modern world rests. In other words, getting beneath it to what we need to know, what uh, in the form of the ancient languages, ancient history, our own history, the cultural sediments which make it possible to think and feel as we do, you know, uh, uh, and that means uh, getting to understand a, a literary inheritance, a musical inheritance, a architectural inheritance, all the things which made the world intelligible to us, modern students are on the whole cut off from all that so they're they um, they their minds are to a great extent tabulae rasae uh, you know uh, and there they are in front of a university lecturer who's scribbling a, a, a his leftist graffiti on these blank sheets yeah. slates but um, it, there would there would have been a time surely where every halfway decent university would have had two or three Roger Scruton types uh, holding mm. the line against the, this lunacy and and had you been a, a curious undergraduate you could have gone to see professor scruton or whoever well that's no more interestingly that would be marvelous if it were true but the fact is when i was at cambridge um i had no idea what the politics of my of the lecturers and professors and, and my own tutors were uh, when same yeah when jonathan bennett who taught us he taught us a, 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 um, ca a course on Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, which he published in two uh, brilliant books. Th this was a really exciting experience, going to his, his lectures. And one day, it was the time of a general election, he came in with a Vote Labour sticker on his lapel, and I was shocked. I thought, you know, we, don't do, we don't show off in front of students uh, our, our personal political opinions. That's uh, uh, almost as vulgar as, uh, as calling people to Christ. You know? <laughs> yes. But uh, is it not, 
it is worse now, isn't it? Oh yes, now it, it would be uh, unthinkable unthinkable that someone would conceal his political opinions because uh, that's what the curriculum now is. It, it's a collection of, uh, of opinionated uh, um, utterances uh, uh, gathered around various traditional texts. Well, does that mean that, uh, I imagine that neither of your boys is going to go to uh, do a humanities subject they're going to do something actually no my son is is down to do theology um, uh, at Oxford as if he gets his A levels right um, but he but he chose theology because precisely because it seemed to be above all that he he loved the idea of studying something which is pure abstract speculation about the nature of the world and the nature of uh, of man in relation to to God and so on these huge things big things yeah yeah um, which is, although he my son interesting enough is political he, I mean I say he's he's very conservative so uh, so he, he hasn't done the, the the standard thing of reacting against no, his no, father no. Uh, uh, I mean my father was a trade union man and a, a, a acti- labor party activists activist when you got into Cambridge he, he refused to speak to you that's it? right yes unfortunately he couldn't cope with the with um, me betraying my class I do, uh, even more so when you took up fox hunting <laughs> well, <laughs> I think by then yes uh, uh, yeah, poor dad yeah yeah um mm. well I, I'm glad you dodged the bullet of of, uh, of having uh, of not having a a left-wing son, because that would be very, mm. very. Uh, well, I don't know. Calling. My daughter is for, is oh. shifting a little bit in that direction. No, but she's, uh, you know, she's been brought up with horses. You can't be unsound in the end uh, if you spend your time with horses, because they are so deeply conservative in their approach to everything. So <sighs> We could we could do a whole separate podcast, couldn't we, on the joy of horses? Let's end up mm. by let's try and find a note of optimism if we can. Mm. Uh, presumably, we're not living in the darkest times that anyone's ever lived through. Mm. Yeah, you, absolutely, and that, that's that is part of the problem <laughs> that um, uh, the the new generation of the young ha- has nothing to confront they've got an abundance of everything of food and clothing and shelter and uh, and opportunities um and um, you know there's some who are less well off than others but there there's a the element of struggle has been re- removed from their lives and i think this does mean that they we've produced a different kind of human type one that's out of touch with our ancestors for whom, you know, who required virtue in order to live properly. They, ha- they had to be courageous, they had to be just and wise and charitable if they were to make their way in, in society. They, they were, in those days, there was a real difference between, uh, between human types, those who could attract to themselves friends and, uh, uh, and a circle of collaborators and those who were on the margins. Now, you know, with, with um, I'm trying to find, you want me to find something cheerful. To well, say, no, no, be depressing uh, for a moment. Run, yeah. run with this one. Yes. Is that, that, uh, obviously, social media and all that helps young people to get by without virtue. You, could, you can cultivate the substitute virtue, the virtue signaling, as it's called, uh, 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 and have friendships which are purely um, spectral. Uh, which exist in cyberspace, but not in reality. So it's it's easy to get by without uh, um, furnishing yourself with the real moral attributes that you need. But I think uh, at a certain stage, all young people wake up to the fact that they've done this and they rebel against it, and they do then want what is real. Uh, and um, my, uh, we, we, you know, we live in this fantastic, privileged position uh, materially. And from the point of view of opportunities, we have lost what is needed to defend it. And we're now going to have to defend it because the Islamists have declared war on us. Yeah. Uh, and we're only at the beginning of it. It's going to be huge. Uh, how, 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 how huge? Well, wait till they get a, a nuclear bomb, you know, or whatever. Uh, and young people are going to have to confront this. And I think they will. Uh, and it will be a painful process, but they'll come out of it. And, and we'll win. But but there'll be a big price to pay along the way. I'm I'm seeing this already just in 
in the conversations on social media mm. that that people are way ahead of where the political class oh, yeah. are. Mm. There's a, there's an anger there, but it's a control anger. It's not yes. a kind of it's it's not a hatred against Muslims. No, no it is very much a, a, a hatred against the system that allows them allows the is, Islamists to yeah. do what they're doing. Absolutely. I, I agree. And I think young people will rebel against it and they will recognise that they've got to take it on board for themselves. That, that these clapped out old geezers who never fought in the Second World War because they were too young yeah. and or in any other war and, and nevertheless control everything through these transnational institutions that take no responsibility for their decisions, that these guys are finished. I think it must have been like that in 1914 for that generation because they'd had we'd had years of, apart from the yes. Boer War. What the last one was Crimea and there was no yes. there's no conscription then. Yeah. So a generation discovered. Yeah, exactly. They discovered that it, that it lived under threat, and which is not unusual. Human beings have lived under threat for the last seventy thousand years, um, ever since they learned to to uh, lift themselves out of the the jungle you know so on that note we have hope it's all going to be absolute we're going to go through hell but we're going to come out at the end of it exactly um thank you so much um professor Sir roger scruton um, you're listening to the dallingpole podcast with me james dallingpole um thank you very much goodbye <laughs>